it's so nice to be here. Um, thank you for attending our talk. We are so excited to be here at Data Festivalisi, and it's so cool to see other data <laughs> practitioners from all over the world. Um, we are from Continentalis, and we tell data stories about Asia. So just to clarify, Singapore is in Southeast Asia, and our stories normally cover Southeast Asia, East Asia, and South Asia. We unfortunately haven't had the chance to work with Central Asia yet, so if there are any Central Asia data storytellers or organizations that work with data from Central Asia, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be very interested to connect with you. Yeah. Um, so today's talk is an introduction to what we do. Um, Continentalists, this is who we are. We aim to help people understand Asia through visualizing data, and by doing so, we cut through the noise and create a bridge between research and the public. So you may or may not have seen some of our works from our website, continentalist.com. Um, this is where we write data stories about Asia, and these stories range from different topics such as the environment, history, to people and culture. Um, we use data to debunk misconceptions about Asia. We also investigate interesting phenomena in Asian societies. And we also write stories that celebrate topics that are unique to us. And we share these stories with the global community. So my name is Amanda. I am the user experience architect at Continentalist. And with me today is Aisha, who is the front end tech lead. So once again, it's really nice to meet everybody. So why we do what we do? The most basic reason is because Asia is shrouded in misconception and is often exoticized. So this means that stories that are being told about Asia might be problematic. So let's just take a look at this example here. A quick search on Google for magazine covers for China all result in something very similar. Why is China often represented by dragons and pandas? Yes, dragons and pandas are part of Chinese culture, but these imagery are taking um, dragons and pandas out of context and framing them in a Eurocentric point of view. So what I mean by this is that if you look at how dragons are used in these images, they are used as this scary creature to symbolize intrusiveness or this sense of otherness to create a sense of fear. But in Chinese culture, dragons are actually compassionate creatures used to symbolize generosity and resilience. And it's not just China. When we look at um, the same covers for India, why are elephants, tigers, and the lotus flower always used? No matter what the topic of the story is, whether it is a political story, a story about social issues, or discussing the economy, why are the same visual tropes constantly used? And this has inadvertently created a mental and even emotional barrier to seeing Asia beyond her stereotype. Um, so this is why our work at Continentalist is important, because we are essentially reclaiming our narrative by telling stories about Asia with context and sensitivity. So this means utilizing reliable sources with Asian-centered lenses and paying attention to nuances that might get lost along the surface. For example, um, objects or practices with a deep significance to heritage and identity. Besides Eurocentrism and Orientalism, Asia also has a pretty big data gap that we are hoping to fill. Um, what I mean by this is that there are countless non-governmental organizations in Asia that spend a lot of time, money, and research um, and effort into research on topics such as social issues. But these data and research, um, they are often not accessible, and only a very small handful of people read them. So this is where we hope data storytelling can come in and make their research and their work more accessible to the general public. And when people have access to data and data storytellings, we hope that they have a better idea of what is at stake and what decisions to make to improve their lives. So instead of chasing the news cycle, we want to champion Asia's culture with data instead. And here is how we have done it. So one fun way is to spotlight aspects of Asian culture that we love and celebrate. 
So in this example, we wrote a story about instant noodles. So instant noodles were invented in Japan, and Asians are the biggest consumers of it. So in this story, we were very curious about why do Asians love instant noodles so much, and we uncovered the different soup flavors, the different types of noodles, and we even compared the average price of instant noodles to the average price of milk and fast food in different countries in Asia. So for this story, we received a lot of love from Asian readers because they found it so resonant and not something you would be able to find in mainstream media. Um, another thing we do is to ensure that cultures, Asian cultures get the representation they deserve. So in this story on indigenous tourism, we explain who these indigenous groups in Asia are. We could have easily summed it up by just saying that they exist in every Southeast Asian country. But instead, um, if you look at the GIF there, we identified the number of groups of indigenous um, people in each country accompanied by a map of where they are actually located. And further down in the story, we also highlighted how some of these indigenous groups have been negatively impacted by tourism. When we talk about stories of Asia, we also don't shy away from myths and legend because even though they may not sound very factual, they are still part of the Asian reality. So in this story about feng shui, which is Chinese geomancy, um, it is basically, think of it like Chinese cosmology. Um, we, instead of using data to prove whether feng shui is a myth or fact, we acknowledge that even though it is classified as a pseudoscience, it still has a very strong impact in Chinese societies today. So if you look at this picture below about um, the skyscrapers with holes in the middle, so this is actually in Hong Kong, and people in Hong Kong believe that there is a dragon in the sky that will fly to the ocean every day to take a shower. And because these skyscrapers are in their path, they have to create holes for them so that the dragon can fly through. And to, and to thank people for the smooth journey, the dragon will bless the people of Hong Kong with wealth, luck, and health. So even though um, feng shui has been historically mocked as being ridiculous or backward, with this story, we wanted to show an alternative perspective that even though um, people might think that it's backward and, and ridiculous, believing in it might have its own benefits too. Um, this is another story we did on myths and legends. Um, we worked with this organization called Supernatural Confessions, and we basically met ghost sightings in Singapore. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that those are where the stories, the ghost sightings are, and we also analyzed the common types of ghosts in Singapore. So, for example, the Pontianak, she's a really famous ghost. Um, one fun fact is, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but Sentosa Island is a very big tourist attraction in Singapore. But interestingly, Sentosa Island is also really haunted. Um, unofficial consensus that it is really haunted because it was um, a mass execution site during the Japanese occupation in World War II. So if you look at the map all the way at the bottom, you see a few ghost icons clustered in the corner. So that is actually where Sentosa is located. And when we do um, stories like this, we are able to organize urban legends in a more tangible manner and even put them to the test. So besides telling stories about Asia, how we tell these stories visually is also very important. We try our best to incorporate Asian elements as much as possible while being sensitive to um, tokenism and stereotypes. So in this example, um, it is a story about sarong, which is a type of cloth um, worn in various parts of Southeast Asia. So when our designer Munira, she was curating the different sarong patterns, she ensured not, she made sure not to just pick patterns from one region, but to choose as many as possible from different ethnic groups and different beliefs to reflect the diversity of the sarong. When she was illustrating these models, um, accuracy was also very important because you don't want to illustrate the model wearing a sarong but with stilettos and a very fancy hairdo because that would be inappropriate and not reflective of how these cultures actually wear the sarong. 
In this other example, we wrote a story on batik. So batik is a traditional textile and it is a time-honored art form that is very much tied to the identity and culture of Indonesia. So in this story, we had a map that was designed to basically look like a piece of batik. So for this, because batik, um, they are traditionally dyed using the bark of the soga tree, so most batik um, fabrics have this brown and yellow tone to it. Our designer tried to capture this quintessential batik look by using a brown and yellow tone color palette as well. And the pattern used on the map um, is also one of the oldest batik patterns called the batik kawung. And she chose it because it was recognizable and it's geometric, which makes for a very beautiful and seamless pattern when you use it as a matte tile. And last but not least, um, batik artisans also use a handheld, handheld tool to apply wax to the fabric. And to recreate that effect, um, the designer layered two to three strokes of the um, lines of the land to create the effect of like seep dye edges. So the design of this map was very meticulous and a lot of research was done to make sure that it was respectful and authentic to the art of batik. So when it comes to telling stories about Asia, we are very careful about delivering them with the proper context, nuance, and visuals that capture their spirit. Um, but here at Conti, we don't just tell the fun and candid stories about Asia. We produce stories with the purpose to drive change and create impact. Since 2019, we have partnered with a lot of organizations like think tanks, NGOs, and nonprofits to bring to life the more serious topics that you see on our site. Many of our partners have invested a lot of time and research into whatever that they are doing with data but unfortunately they may not have the greatest accessibility or outreach to reach larger public audience. This is where Continentalist comes in. We learn our skills to make good data more accessible. We help to close the gap between the public and the, we help to close the gap between our partners and their data with the larger public audience. We are very proud of our partnership works over the years and here are a few of our partnerships that we have done. Some of them are local organizations based in Singapore, such as Foodscape Collective and AWARE. AWARE is a local advocacy group in Singapore who, is, um, who champions women's rights and gender equality. Others you may have seen before because they are international organizations, such as the UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, Doctors Without Borders, BirdLife International, and Wild Otters. So climate change, sustainability and conservation, as well as human rights and social justice are two huge topics that our team cares about. We feel that it's important to bring these topics and have conversations about them with the larger public audience. So we hope to create a lasting impact on our stories regarding these two um, huge topics, which is why in all our stories, we try to end with a call to action so that our readers after reading our stories, will be encouraged or prompted to think about what they can do next. Telling stories about human rights um, and social justice can be quite challenging. The key for us is to balance the data and research while providing the correct context and exercising sensitivity when telling these stories. In 2019, we partnered with UNHCR to talk about the Rohingya refugee crisis that was happening in Myanmar. For this story, we opted to trace the journey the refugees took when they embarked on a journey to leave their home country. We used data visualizations like maps and a Sankey diagram to show how many refugees actually got displaced from their home countries and how many of them, and out of that number, how many of them actually found a place to live um, when they embarked on a journey. But we are also aware that when we are creating these charts, these are people with real stories and lived experiences. To make the story more human or to bring in a more human aspect to the story, we supplemented the story with more qualitative data without just, without just relying on quantitative data to create our charts. So we use multimedia assets such as interview audio snippets from the refugees themselves, quotes, and also a background ambient noise from the refugee camps to supplement the story. 
The design of the story is also important and pivotal in the whole data storytelling experience. Our designers for this story deliberated a lot on the color palette so as to not make it too dark, but also balance with the seriousness and the somberness of the topic. So as you can see, we used a lot of dark gray and navy to bring the storytelling across. And you can see here, we also always end our stories with a call to action about what our readers can do towards the end. Besides doing data storytelling, Conti is also committed to bringing together Asian data practitioners from around the Southeast Asian region. We want to be able to grow and connect the Asian data community. So how do we do that? We created a section in our Medium blog called Meet the Community to shine the spotlight on other Asian data practitioners. You can be doing things like data visualization, data journalism, data analysts, but what we wanted to do was to create a safe space for Asian data practitioners to come together and share what they have been doing with their work with data. So these are a few of the people that we have interviewed so far. You can go ahead to our blog on Medium, it's at Continentalist. Um, to check out their work. So this is pretty important to us because Asia is so diverse, but with this blog, we, could able, we are able to check out hyper-local issues that would otherwise not be covered by mainstream media. In addition, we also realized that Continentalist has readers from really diverse backgrounds and expertise. This diversity could very well contribute to the stories that we want to tell which is why this year, a couple of our works would not have been possible without ground out data crowdsourcing and collection. Amanda mentioned how there was a data gap in Asia, and we could fill this gap by making an open call to our readers in order to create a collaborative data set. So this year, we wanted to create a story about Asian science fiction. When you think about science fiction, I think most of us would gravitate towards things that is Hollywood made famous, like Blade Runner or Dune. So we wanted to find an Asian angle towards, Asian, uh, towards science fiction itself. So we made a call to our readers on Twitter and Instagram and asked them if they knew of any science fiction works based in Asia, be it film, comics, or literature. The result, the result was tremendous, and we created a database in Notion that is open to public where we tag each Asian science fiction um, work by different properties like media types, length, the year of publication, so on and so forth. And with this database, we could analyze the science fiction works based in Asia and create a data story from around it. This is really cool because it taught us that as a, data, as a data storytelling studio, we don't work in silos. It's really okay to ask for help when needed because in Singapore, our main languages might just be Malay, Chinese, and English, but when we make an open call, we are more aware towards other languages such as Tagalog in the Philippines, there's Bahasa Indonesia in Indonesia, and Bahasa Malaysia in Malaysia. With the growing enthusiasm and in, in, in interest in data visualization, we thought that it was a good time for Conti to also branch out into resource sharing and education. While data visualization is cool and nice to look at, we also want people to be able to understand what exactly they are looking at. Thus, one of our site projects recently was to promote data literacy in the region. So we run a data literacy series called Data Deep Dive that gives bite-sized information ranging from basic statistics, data visualization, and analytics. We do this in a very comic style, like, and it's very quirky explainer, and it's really cute to attract people and lowers the barrier of entry into data, data literacy itself. Besides that, we are really proud to launch our inaugural data visualization and storytelling workshop. We were very heartened by the support that we got, not just from in Singapore, but also around Southeast Asia and beyond. Um, we pulled together the best practices from our three internal teams, the editorial, I'm from the development team, Amanda's from the design team, and we shared the best practices that we had, such as the tools that we use and how to pitch a good editorial for data storytelling. And finally, DataViz is a rising scene in Asia, and we welcome you to support it. We are really heartened and excited to meet other DataViz practitioners from around the region in Southeast Asia and here in Central Asia. Here's a few examples of other studios in Southeast Asia that you might want to check out. 
We have Punjab in Thailand, DB and Myanmar data citizens in Myanmar, Kata data and Pulse Lab from Indonesia, as well as Kini News Lab from Malaysia. I'll just pause here for a while for you to take a snapshot of this. And next slide. Okay, last one, I promise. Okay, we're also available for hire. So as a data storytelling studio, we found that our skill sets are in demand because other people also want to tell data stories by their own rights. So here's a few of the projects that we made. We're very proud of this bottom one here, which is a climate visualization that was presented during the COP26 last year. And we also do annual reports for banks and maps, investigative maps for um, other think tanks and non-profits. We'll be sharing more about our best practices from a designer developer perspective tomorrow during the workshop track. So do join us and check us out if you're interested in what we do. And if you're curious about our work, here are our socials. We are very active on Instagram and Twitter. We also have a newsletter called Notes from the Equator because Singapore is based on the equator. So we're from Notes, we're called Notes at the Equator. And finally, thank you so much to the DataFest organizers for calling us all the way from Singapore. And we're really happy to, to be here and see you guys. Thank you so much.